Hi class, in this recording we're going to focus on how urine is stored and released from the urinary system. So as we make ear, as we look at the urinary system, we're continually making urine, but we're not continually going to the bathroom, and that's a good thing. We urinate f infrequently. We have episodic urine, which is in the way of saying that we urinate every once in a while, not nonstop. And we need something to store the urine and control its release for this episodic urine, or in other words, to urinate when it's convenient to urinate. So as we're looking at the kidneys, as urine is produced from the kidneys, it's going to be carried down to the urinary bladder, and it's going to be carried through a tube called the ureter. This ureter is a muscular tube that has a lot of smooth muscle in it to help push the urine down to the urinary bladder with peristalsis. Each ureter is approximately 25 centimeters long, and it's going to pass and enter into the posterior side of the urinary bladder. Where the ureter enters the urinary bladder, there is a valve made up of a mucosal flap. And this helps to keep urine from backing up into the ureters so that we have unidirectional flow of urine into our urinary bladders. Within our ureter, we have three layers of tissue. We have an outer layer of adventitia that anchors the ureter in place followed up by muscularis, a smooth muscle, and there's two layers of smooth muscle. We have longitudinal and circular layers of smooth muscle to aid with that peristaltic movements of the urine through the ureter. And then on the innermost part of the ureter, we have a mucosa that's made up of a transitional epithelium. Here is a photomicrograph of ureter mucosa. Notice how the transitional epithelium exhibits that characteristic scalloped edge to it. Um, and this is um, relaxed transitional epithelium as opposed to distended tr transitional epithelium. This mucosa is going to start all the way back at the minor calyces within the kidneys and extends all the way through to the urinary bladder. And the lumen, the opening on the inside of the ureter is very narrow and it's going to be um, and this is kind of a double-edged sword. It's good that it's narrow because it helps to accelerate the rate of fluid flow, but it's bad that it's narrow because that means that we can have kidney stones obstruct the, urine, the ureters very easily. As we look at the urinary bladder itself, this is a, the muscular sac or the muscular bag that receives the urine. It's located on the inferior margin or the floor of the pelvic cavity. It's inferior to the peritoneum and posterior to the pubic symphysis, so it's down deep in that pelvic cavity. And it has three layers. On the superficial margins, it has the parietal peritoneum anchoring it, and it has on the superior margin fibrous adventitia, and this fibrous adventitia serves to help to, help to further anchor it. There's a layer, there's a muscle that makes up most of the urinary bladder's volume that has three layers of smooth muscle. And these three layers of smooth muscle are going to be combined to be called the detrusor muscle, the muscle of urination. Lining the urinary bladder, we have more transitional epithelium. And these, uh, this particular transitional epithelium, because it's going to be exposed to a lot of urine, is going to have a special kind of cell on its surface known as umbrella cells. And these umbrella cells on the surface are going to help protect our body, the transitional epithelium in particular of the urinary bladder, from the highly salty and relatively acidic urine that it's storing. And to help the urinary bladder expand, we have rugae, folds of tissue that will become more prominent as we empty the urinary bladder and stretch out and go away as we fill our urinary bladder. So here we can see a urinary bladder. It's mostly made up of the muscle, the detrusor muscle that makes up its body. We have the rugae in the back. And then we have the two openings from the ureters. And between the two openings of the ureter and the urethral opening, we have a triangular space of smooth tissue known as the trigone. And this trigone helps to funnel urine into the urethral opening. As we look at the volume capacity of our urinary bladder, it's moderately full at half a liter, um, but can hold up to 700, 800, even 1,000 milliliters um, if somebody 
has really been holding it for a long time. Our urinary bladder is highly distensible, which is a nice way of saying that it's really stretchy. It can blow up like a balloon as it fills with urine. And as we fill it with urine, it expands superiorly towards the abdominal pelvic cavity, the rugae flatten, and the transitional epithelium will go from five or six layers of cells down to two or three layers of cells as that transitional epithelium is distended and stretched out. The urethra exiting our urinary bladder is a tube that just carries urine to the outside of the body. And as we look at the female urethra, which is pictured on the screen over here, our female urethra begins as the, we exit the urinary bladder to the opening on the body. And in the female urethra in particular is quite short. It's about three to four centimeters long, which is to say that it's about one and a half to one and three quarter inches long. And uh, the female urethra is also going to be attached or bound to the anterior wall, the, shoot, the L got cut off there, anterior wall of the vagina. So during the birthing process, if there's any tearing that may occur in the vaginal canal, that tearing may also inadvertently cause some damage to the female, female urethra. The external urethral orifice is going to be located in between the vaginal orifice and the clitoris within the vulva of the female, or within the vestibule of the female's anatomy. The external urethral sphincter is labeled here, located there, and that external urethral sphincter is going to be a band of muscle that passes through the pelvic floor, that is anchored in the pelvic floor where the urethra exits through the pelvic floor. And it's worth emphasizing that this external urethral sphincter is made of skeletal muscle and is under voluntary control. As we look at the male urethra, the male urethra is significantly longer than the female urethra. And that has primarily to account for the fact that the male urethra has to pass through a penis. There are three regions of the male urethra. There's the prostatic urethra, which goes through the prostate gland, the membranous urethra, which goes through the urogenital diaphragm, and the spongy urethra, which travels through the penis, is erectile tissue. The male's urethra, the male urethra, notably, has a much more prominent internal urethral sphincter compared to the female urethra. So if we back up a slide here, oop, I went forward. If we back up a slide here, for the female anatomy, there is not a noticeable, I mean, it, there are some muscle fibers present, but there are, there's not a significant amount of muscle fibers making up the internal sphincter urethral sphincter within the female urethra. And this is one of the anatomic reasons why women are more likely to have adult incontinence than males are, or men are. And this is because of the, the lack of those internal sphincter muscles. And another reason why adult women are more likely to have incontinence than adult men is because that there can be damage to this external urethral sphincter during the childbirth process. So this is an important consideration um, to think about, and it's one of the reasons why we just, just need to show more compassion to people in general. Um, if somebody needs to make a lot of bathroom stops, just let them make their bathroom stops. Um, as we look at the male anatomy, we have a prominent internal urethral sphincter and external urethral sphincter. That internal urethral sphincter within the male anatomy is from a thickening of the detrusor muscle itself and a fiber orientation change within the smooth muscle to detrusor. As we look at the external urethral sphincter, this is going to be made up of skeletal muscle of the pelvic floor, just like the female's urethral sphincter is. To get urine out of the body, we will void that urine. So the act of urination is voiding. So we, we're, first we have peeing, and then the technical word for peeing is urinating. The technical word for urinating is voiding. And this is what we do to get the urine out of our urinary bladder. The detrusor muscle is going to relax as we fill the urinary bladder, and the urethral sphincters will be tightly closed. To keep the urine in the urinary bladder, we have some sympathetic activity that is going to cause the detrusor 
muscle to relax and the internal urethral sphincter to be excited. In other words, for the urinary bladder to fill up. And we have some somatic muscle fibers that are going to cause the external urethral sphincter to have voluntary control. And the somatic muscle fibers are going to pass all the way up through the sacral or all the way through the sacral spinal cord so that we'll have control of those muscles at the lower end of our bodies. When it's time to void the urine, we micturate it. So the technical term for voiding in this context is micturation. This is the most technical term I know of for urinating. And the, this act of urinating is controlled by the micturation reflex that's involuntarily regulated by the spinal cord. As our urinary bladder fills up, we have stretch receptors which have increasing activation, sending signals to the spinal cord. So afferent means traveling to the spinal cord. Every once in a while, we, there are times when our bladder is not full enough. You know, this one, like you're going on a, ro a long road trip and you stop to get gas at the gas station. And while you're there, you take the time to go and go to the bathroom because you know you don't want to, you're going to have to go soon anyways. So why not just go right now and save yourself an extra stop? If you want to just go to the bathroom anyways, you can use the Valsalva maneuver. You take in a breath of air. <gasps> And you bear down and you can compress your urinary bladder. You will, and this compression of the urinary bladder excites the stretch receptors to trigger an early micturation reflex. That's all we have for this recording. If you have any questions or comments, please feel free to post them in the class discussion board or to shoot me an email. And as always, happy studies.